when being invited here, I was obviously thinking a little bit about what to say. And I was aware that this might be a bit of a mixed audience. So I thought I'd uh, put together a series of slides following some ideas I had about what I wanted to say about osteoarthritis and in particular perhaps the progress we made and the challenges we face and uh, how we might improve things as they are today to work better for our patients with osteoarthritis both through uh, trying to develop new and better treatments but also how to better use the knowledge we have so that's kind of my starting line now uh, there is a let's see right turn not working but i'll use the keyboard no, don't worry there is a roadmap for you tonight and uh, what I'm going to start out to give to you is a few facts because I believe in facts. I trust facts. I trust facts more than beliefs. And uh, facts in the field where I'm working, I have a medical background obviously and I'm from the, thank you, medical profession. Uh, and that is often what we call evidence. And I'm a believer in evidence, in facts and I trust facts more than I trust beliefs in general, in the general sense. So that's what I'm going to start with about osteoarthritis. And I'll also touch on the term of sustainable in that context. And uh, then I'll continue into the meat of my presentation, which is about osteoarthritis, obviously, trying to summarize to you what we know of what osteoarthritis is and uh, why we get it and how we get it and how we treat it and the importance of getting it right the first time and uh, the importance of recognizing in today's uh, toolbox that we use what's the good what's the bad and what might even be the ugly in the form of our current ways of managing osteoarthritis and uh, I will conclude, as you will note on the note, that uh, it is not knowledge we lack, actually, in much of what we do. It's rather actually the, the uh, uh, using that knowledge, recognizing that knowledge and acting by it. And then finally, I'll also say a few words on where we might go from here, knowing a little bit about what's in the pipeline in the way of developing new treatments for osteoarthritis uh, in both the way of new drugs and perhaps other things as well. So, a few facts as a warm-up. One in ten Australians is affected by osteoarthritis. That makes it like somewhere between two and three million. One in ten, obviously, being a somewhat approximate, somewhat a bit of an approximation. And osteoarthritis accounts for more functional limitation and disability than any other chronic disease among the elderly. This is number one. And this number one disease is the reason for 90% of all the total joint replacements we make, you make, in Australia. And that's about 100,000 per year. That's a big number. And uh, these numbers keep increasing. And uh, that means also that uh, you are, as Australian taxpayers and insurance payers, spending a lot of money on this particular disease and on this form of treatment to the, to the note that one dollar out of approximately one thousand of the gross domestic products is used for joint replacement for osteoarthritis and when one intervention for one disease actually makes a dent in the gross domestic products i think it's time to take note would you agree so onwards, if you don't think that number is impressive, think about $23 billion approximately, which is what osteoarthritis costs the Australian economy each year. If 
you look at all costs, including the indirect costs. And moreover, these numbers will increase forward in time because we know what causes osteoarthritis. We know which people who haven't got osteoarthritis or will get it in the future because of the risk factors they carry, literally. We know that uh, there is going to be an increase in the population in Australia. That means bigger numbers. We know that the population is getting older. Well, world populations do that, generally speaking, especially in the, in the richer countries. And finally, and unfortunately, we keep getting larger and fatter. And that's another thing that's not very good for osteoarthritis risk. And onwards from there, what about pain caused by osteoarthritis? More than every other Australian with osteoarthritis reports moderate or severe pain. And problematic in the sense of treating that is that the current treatments we have for osteoarthritis pain have a, I would say, modest effect, meaning they do help, but they don't usually take the problem away or fully. And there is no treatment today which enables us to slow down the disease, stop the disease, or even revert the disease, cure the disease, so to say. Meaning that if you got osteoarthritis, you have osteoarthritis for life. This doesn't mean that you necessarily will have bad symptoms all the time, but you will have your osteoarthritis for life. And moreover and finally, I used to say when I worked with osteoarthritis a few years back that uh, you don't die of osteoarthritis. Well, that's at least something, but I was wrong. We now have new data showing that actually if you have osteoarthritis, you have an excess of risk of dying of other diseases such as cardiovascular diseases <coughs> connected with osteoarthritis. So you, yes, you actually die from this disease as well. And the increased risk is about in different uh, studies between 15 and 30 percent. Now if you remember these numbers that I've just given you about osteoarthritis, one single musculoskeletal disease, and then I'll talk about a term called sustainable. You've heard that a lot when it comes to environment and agriculture and whatnot. In this particular case I'm talking about sustainable health care and by that I mean two different things. Sustainable, being able to be maintained at a certain level. That's about dollars, resources, etc. And the second one is being able to be upheld or defended and that I look upon as an ethics issue with regards to how we deal with our patients, our, our professional ethics, etc. I'll come back to this, but just to introduce this term to you. Now, with regards to that term sustainable and with regards to what I told you about osteoarthritis, in the rich countries we know costs of health care are rising faster than economic growth in general, so the proportion of health care costs out of the gross national product is increasing and that cannot obviously not continue forever. There's got to be a ceiling somewhere. And the global of MSK diseases is also increasing in the world, not only in uh, the rich countries. So there is an increasing focus on health for the dollar, effectiveness and cost effectiveness of interventions. And as the Americans would say, uh, bang for the buck health for the dollar. And uh, this is becoming an ever more in, uh, important issue. When I was starting as a young orthopedic surgeon, we spent much of our staff meetings talking about the most recent cases and the, uh, the uh, new results being uh, published in journals and uh, how things were going for our patients. These days, much of the discussions are about the money. The, the budget of the department and how we can make sure that we somehow survive until the next budget year. And this is one small reflection of this particular issue. 
So it's getting increasingly important in the management of osteoarthritis, but obviously any disease, but I'll, I'll <laughs> limit myself to osteoarthritis, to get it right the first time when we meet a patient and eliminate ineffective and in interventions and practices. So we need to get it right and we need to stop doing things that are not <coughs> effective. So having said this and having summarized a bit of the background as a trailer for what's coming now, I'll get into osteoarthritis as a disease, as something that happens to many of us, not all fortunately, but many of us, and how we treat this condition today. The prototypical osteoarthritis patient, to me at least, when I started working with osteoarthritis, is this old lady here. We think of osteoarthritis as a disease that happens to old people. And uh, we may think of them as uh, yeah, managing and complaining about having pain in their joints, etc., especially uh, when uh, getting up in the morning and especially after sitting still for a while, but uh, managing reasonable well still. She's been out in the mailbox obviously picking up the daily paper and she seems to be getting getting by but she's got knee osteoarthritis, you can see her bow legs etc. And she has pain, she has impairment of function, she has loss of participation, she's unable to go to her friends uh, who lives in a nearby farm, uh, she can't cycle anymore so she's getting lonely and her quality of life obviously is affected. Now, that might be the prototypical patient for many of us, but many of the patients actually today are quite different from that lady. Patients who uh, start getting overweight early in life and continue that trajectory, getting obese, have a distinctly and quite markedly uh, increased risk of getting, in particular, knee osteoarthritis. In fact, this is probably the major uh, modifiable risk factor that we're dealing with with osteoarthritis. Sports injuries, uh, knee injuries in athletes uh, playing in, in various field sports, uh, Aussie uh, rules, I'm sure, but as well uh, soccer being the, or football being the world's largest sport is a good supplier of knee injuries for those of us interested in, in sports injuries and a number of others. And of course, uh, long life of, a long life of hard physical work may also wear on some joints and uh, generate osteoarthritis. That, of course, in the richer countries is becoming r rare, but is a reality in the poorer countries. So why do we get osteoarthritis? Well, age, it's more common when we get older. Does that mean that age in itself is a cause of osteoarthritis? Probably not, but you can look at it as a long life of accumulating small injuries to your joints or small insults to your joint if you want, if you want to consider a more perhaps uh, realistic uh, uh, explanation for the age influence. Heritability, blame it on your parents. In your genes that you've inherited from your parents, uh, carry, you carry approximately half of your risk and in spite of much and quite expensive genetic studies on osteoarthritis, we only know, we can only explain a very small proportion of that genetic risk. And most importantly, and down here at the bottom, lifestyle. Diet and exercise, use and abuse of joints at work and leisure. So, diet and exercise, that's essentially the overweight and underuse of your joints and use and abuse of joints that are sports injuries and in farmers, for example, uh, lifelong hard work or other uh, industry, work, uh, other people that uh, have a physically demanding job. Now, the obesity, I'm coming back to that because that is one very important risk factor today and increasingly so. In the US, we calculate that roughly 30% of the risk for osteoarthritis is due to overweight. I think Australia is up there somewhere, quite likely, looking at the numbers that you have. And 
that added to physical inactivity, weak muscles, that increases risk of osteoarthritis. I would say that nearly everyone that comes and needs a joint replacement of the knee is overweight, either overweight or obese. It's quite uncommon that people that are in the normal quote-unquote range of BMI need joint replacements for osteoarthritis of the knee. So having talked a little bit about osteoarthritis and of course just quite superficially a few words on how osteoarthritis actually develops into that symptomatic classic condition as osteoarthritis with the typical symptoms and the typical radiographic findings and so forth. That begins obviously with a person without osteoarthritis who somewhere along the line going from not having OA to having OA is recognized as having that condition. And we've been in our diagnostic procedures being fairly, um, I should say, conservative, quite restrictive in the past, saying that we do need to see the combination of the classical symptoms and we do need to see those classical radiographic changes on the plain x-ray we now recognize that those patients with those signs are quite far advanced already. And we're working to be able to identify these patients with osteoarthritis earlier, earlier in their career as just osteoarthritis patients. And I personally today actually regard osteoarthritis as a clinical diagnosis. I'm saying that a per person who has the classic symptoms who is of the approximately right age, who has some family history, etc., and that I examine in my office and finds that that person has the cl typical clinical signs. I don't need to do an x-ray. I don't need to do an MRI. I know this is osteoarthritis. And the radiographic exam or the MRI is not going to change my therapy for that patient, so why should I do it? Now, the development of osteoarthritis may begin with a sports injury, such as an insult, for example, and that makes that particular model of osteoarthritis as an interesting one because we can follow the disease from day one, essentially, into a more full-fledged uh, disease state. Or a more subtle uh, cause like overweight and obesity that develops into, in the joint of these patients into something preclinically without symptoms that eventually elicits symptoms like pain, stiffness in the knees or the hips or whatever joint we're talking about in these patients. And that will sometimes also show up later with the classic radiographic signs as having loss of what we call the joint space. This is a frontal picture of a knee joint. This is the tibia, the femur, the fibula here, and what we call the joint space, which in reality means that's where the cartilage is. And there is no joint space here, so there's no joint cartilage there. And that's disappeared in the process of the disease. And some of the patients will eventually end up with a consultation with the orthopedic surgeon and considering being considered for a joint replacement. But it's no it, it is not a given that a patient that perhaps recognizes joint symptoms up here or even has joint changes on the x-ray will actually end up having a joint replacement. We, in fact, that is one of the major challenges we're facing today because we cannot, with any, any degree of precision, identify those patients who will continue their career and end up here as OA patients and those that will actually spend the rest of their life as an OA patient but around remain in this area and this is one where uh, one question one challenge that we're actually now working quite hard at trying to solve so this again repeats that when I see the OA patients I really don't know which pa which way that patient is going to go I can say that yes you have a 
10 or 20 percent risk of developing late stage osteoarthritis and, and the need perhaps for a joint replacement. But I cannot say for sure whether that will happen to you or not, or whether you will remain more or less in that area in the middle. Have a good life with osteoarthritis in the best of cases. So that's the quick summary of osteoarthritis, some facts. Now, how do we in healthcare deal with osteoarthritis then? How do we manage the disease? How do we treat the disease? Whether we are GPs or orthopedic surgeons or physios or uh, whatever we are in this particular area dealing with the musculoskeletal diseases. Well, I would say again and emphasize it's a lot about getting it right the first time. And I'll comment on that as, as we go along. And this is a one picture summary of the ver various treatment modalis modalities that we use. Exercise, painkillers, surgery. Very simple, but actually not very simple in real life. So let me comment on each of these and uh, start with this triangle here, where we use this triangle to say that for essentially every osteoarthritis patient, be that a patient who is early in the symptomatic phases or late with really quite severe symptoms, what we start with and what we shall start with according to the very best evidence we have today is information about what is this disease, how do we treat it, and what's your likelihood of getting to this or this kind of treatment as an end stage. Exercise, structured exercise programs, personalized for the individual, a weight loss program, commonly, because most of our customers are overweight. Self-management and whatever else is in, in that general area. And uh, there are uh, treatment modalities such as uh, cognitive behavioral treatment, etc., which is way off my expertise area and I can barely pronounce them, so I won't go into them but stay where I'm reasonably uh, secure. So, of course, not everyone is uh, sufficiently helped by what's here. And for those patients, we do continue with what's here, but add drugs, walking aids, various devices that are available to us. And that's helpful for many patients. <coughs> And actually, those two parts of that tri triangle will be helpful for the great majority of patients, and they will not be needing to progress to the tip of that triangle containing surgical interventions of various kinds. Many patients that come came to me, I retired from clinical work now, but that came to me were wondering and, and, and thinking that they might end up in a wheelchair or they would need a new knee or something like that, but I always told them, and that's still true, that that only happens to a minority of patients, perhaps 20, 25 percent, one in four, or something like that, one in three at the most, and most not. But within that triangle that I just summarized treatments, there are the good things, the bad things, and a few ugly things, and I'll comment as I go along. Let's start with the statement that your joints are made to move. You, many of you are physios, so I shouldn't have to tell you that, but uh, I think it bears repeating. Your joints are made to move, and it's much with joints as it is with bones, and I'm sure you are aware of bone physiology to some extent telling you that it's use it or lose it. If you don't use your bones, the bones will disappear. If you don't use your joints and your joint cartilage, the cartilage will actually disappear, at least partly. This is a slice of a human knee joint. You can see the femur, the upper end, the whiteness, the joint cartilage, the tibia, the tibial cartilage, the menisci, there and there, slice through them. 
the patellar tendon and so forth and that's the joint that is made to move and it's quite a remarkable design in my in my view because uh, if you consider that uh, we should be moving say 10,000 steps a day maybe we do maybe we don't but ideally we do and uh, through our lifetime that makes it anyone quick who calculates I cheated, I did it beforehand. It's be between 200 million and 300 million load cycles in your lifetime. And considering that most of us actually have our real joints all the way through life, a minority need them replaced. I think that's pretty good for a design of a quite effective uh, little uh, device making us um, able to move around. And I challenge you to think about uh, a car or a washing machine that lasts your lifetime. So this one's doing pretty well. But only if you take good care of it. Like 10,000 steps a day or something of that order. Maybe not all through all phases of life, but most phases of life. And uh, for those with osteoarthritis, the evidence is now overwhelming that exercise is good medicine for osteoarthritis of the knee and quite likely also of the hip although the evidence there is not quite as strong as for the knee but not just any exercise or any little dose of exercise you actually need something on the order of a dozen focused supervised progressed sessions over at least six weeks and uh, as uh, one of my colleagues used to say who's a physio exercise is like bread it's best fresh and you of course uh, have to continue to do this as a lifestyle change if this is what you intend if you are aspiring to to experience the good effects from uh, exercise treatment obviously it's easy to say what I just said about exercise in that preceding sli slide but it's far more difficult in reality to get people to do this what we developed or rather my colleague de colleagues developed in Sweden about 10 years ago is something called BOA BOA better management of patients with osteoarthritis is what the program is called and uh, this became a national program and a quality registry in Sweden and it's about educating physi physiotherapists that educate patients about osteoarthritis and about exercise and through an exercise program also connected with that and today around 4,000 physios in Sweden have been educated through this about 600 primary care clinics are involved all over the country. These are symbols of the primary care symbol uh, clinics that are involved on the map of Sweden. And Lund is down here, Stockholm is here, the northern part of the country is up there above the polar circle. And we've now treated roughly 100,000 patients in this program. So this is essentially a way to disseminate this and implement the the principles that were in the on the, on the previous slide data on uh, on the results of this can be downloaded from uh, the uh, the website uh, on the lower left corner there now in a subsequent development uh, one of my colleagues Eva Roos and the uh, Søren School at the uh, South Danish University in Denmark developed what they termed good life with osteoarthritis in Denmark, uh, smartly termed the GLAD, an evidence-based uh, program for uh, or tool for clinicians. This is sort of an extension, a further development based on the original BOA concept. It uh, involves uh, a two-day course, two course for physios and other health professions, uh, GPs as well eight weeks of education and supervised neuromuscular exercise for the patients with knee or hip OA, and then the patients, as in the BOA, actually report back into a central register the data or the results they have and when they begin, the res results they have at the end of the course, 
and how they're doing at 12 months after finishing that course. And uh, the results are again available on the website here. Some of them have been published as well. And the results in BOA and in the GLAD programs are both rather good for, I would say, a low-tech, uh, rather uh, low-cost treatment. <coughs> and uh, some 30,000 Danes have been through the GLAD program, leading to reduced pain, better function, increased physical activity level, and fewer on sick leave and fewer taking painkillers. That's the result of this program. And this program has now been launched also in Canada, in Australia. There is an Australian website. Just uh, Google on GLAD Australia and you'll find it. And in China. And it's being launched in Norway, I would know as well, and Switzerland and New Zealand. And uh, the results are quite consistent. Uh, 25 to... 40 or 35 percent improvement in pain in all of them. They just had a few patients in China so far but it's being uh, uh, launched there as well and I think they have another couple of million patients to do, uh, a couple of billion patients to do before they're done there. Now of course this is the digital age so uh, there are ongoing developments of uh, web apps or mobile phone apps or what have you that will do some of what's being done in those face-to-face -face programs. There is one already in place in Australia called My Joint Pain where patients report in their data. There is one being developed called My OA and there is another one that's being has been developed in Sweden called Joint Academy and as an example let me just show what the latter one actually uh, intends to do and this is essentially a digital version of the GLAD program or the BOA program containing the same components and actually now being being uh, certified by the health insurance system in Sweden so this is an alternative for those who would rather do this on their mobile phone or rather than going to the physio clinic or who might actually have a long way to go to the physio clinic. And I think that might be something that would be in, of interest in a country like Australia, where physios clearly may not be available everywhere. Some of those out there could perhaps uh, use a, an, an app like this. It's not instead of the GLAD program or the BOA, it's a complement to actually increase the uh, the ability to disseminate and implement this um, program. So that's about exercise and that really is a central component of dealing with osteoarthritis today. Paracetamol is available under a number of brand names, uh, available over the counter, OTC as it's called, and uh, that's been used for a long time, but the more recent studies actually suggest that the effect of paracetamol on osteoarthritis pain is really, really quite minimal, and uh, perhaps it's not really worth it to try that. And there is then also the risk of accidental or intentional overdose of paracetamol, which will, uh, which will uh, kill your liver, which is really quite difficult to, to treat. So these to intoxications are not a good thing to be dealing with. And therefore, the enthusiasm for paracetamol as a painkiller, I think, is waning a bit in many countries. The big name in osteoarthritis and many other types of pain is are the called so-called NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory <coughs> drugs, of which there is a whole family, and they don't differ that much uh, between themselves. And there is a separate class in them called coxibs as well that belongs again to the same family. We primarily recommend using the topical creams as a first choice. And a second choice, we would recommend using taking the pulse orally, but with considerable care for those with high blood pressure, 
heart problems, GI conditions, etc., gastrointestinal conditions, because of the well-known side effects of these types of drugs. And since many of our patients uh, with osteoarthritis are a little on the older side, obviously then uh, high blood pressure, heart problems, etc., are common with these patients. So you can see the challenge we're facing. What do we do? What can we give our patients? I need something to, pre to prescribe for our patients, obviously, when they need a painkiller. It's quite a significant problem today. So therefore, uh, many have uh, been reverting to uh, stronger pain medications. And uh, that, in essence, is uh, that the, the group we call opioids, which are morphine uh, derivatives of various kinds. There is a whole uh, series of them out on the market. And they have been marketed, marketed quite heavily for chronic pain, including osteoarthritis. Now, finally, there are some good studies ban done comparing the efficacy of NSAIDs and opioids. And the results show that the opioids are not stronger painkillers than NSAIDs for OA pain. Maybe for other types of pain, but not for osteoarthritic pain. That's statement number one. My statement number two is that um, chronic pain is very common and opioids are increasingly used to treat these conditions. This is a problem. Why is that? In Sweden, for example, every fourth patient with osteoarthritis in a given year has been handed a prescription of an opioid. Now, opioids, morphine derivatives, there is potential for abuse, and if you are elderly, they are really difficult to handle because they give you obstipation, they give you dizziness, and they give you drowsiness, and if you have osteoarthritis, a bit of difficulty walking, and you add an opioid to that, and you fall over and break your hip. Is that a better alternative? No, not quite. So this is really a problem. And you probably read in the papers about the opioid epidemic in the United States. I'm sure there is an opioid epidemic in many other countries as well, but it's better perhaps mapped and publicized in the United States. In 2017, two years ago, in the United States, in that year, 70,000 people died from opioid overuse. 70,000, that's more people that are getting killed in the roads in the US one year, and that's a lot of people still getting killed on the roads. 70,000 people. That's more people that, than were killed in the entire what, Vietnam War, etc. So this is a huge problem. Of course, not all of that originates from prescribing patients with osteoarthritis, but when you prescribe patients with osteoarthritis, that's a big number of patients. They are commonly prescribed for OA, so that adds to the flow of opioids out on the market. And it creates addiction among a proportion of these patients. So bottom line, do not prescribe opioids for osteoarthritis, period. Don't do it. This is one of those really uglies that were that's, that are on my list that I indicated earlier on. So here is something else that's interesting: arthroscopic surgery for a painful knee of the middle-aged and older patient. And remember now, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I've been there, done that. I've done that, yes, literally. And uh, until I started reading the literature in well, 15, 20 years ago. And this is a diagram that I'll explain a little bit for you. It's a, what we call a forest plot. And on the left here are a series of studies starting 1993 in chronological order down to 2018. And the name of the author and the year of publication. Here in the middle is a vertical line with a zero. To the left of that, the treatment favors the surgical group. To the right of that, the treatment given favors the comparison group. So here are those patients that 
were favored by the osteoscopic surgery and here are those that were favored by the control treatment, the comparison treatment, which often in this series of studies was actually an exercise program. In a few of them it was actually placebo surgery, sham surgery, pretend surgery, not the real surgery but pretend surgery. And it's a cumulative forest plot, meaning that each result is added to the previous results. So the confidence intervals, the variation within that group or the, the certainty of that mean value which is indicated by the vertical little symbol here gets narrower and narrower. And you can see that already almost 10 years ago we actually knew that this treatment osteoscopic surgery for the painful knee in the middle-aged patient was actually not really effective. Well, I'll correct myself. It is a little bit effective, like three millimeters approximately on a 100 millimeter scale. That's what you gain from the surgery as compared to an exercise program. And those who practice will say, well, see, I was right. Arthroscopy is better. And yes, it is better, a little. But um, if you then consider that the uh, relevant greater benefit needs at least, the patient relevant greater benefit needs to be at least 15 millimeters. This is not a clinically relevant difference favoring arthroscopic surgery. It may be a statistically favorable uh, for arthroscopic surgery, but not, certainly not clinically. So the conclusion of all of those studies together is that lifestyle modifications and exercise are as effective as arthroscopic surgery in the managing of the pale for knee of the middle-aged and older patients. Many of these patients have meniscus lesions, they have a bit of osteoarthritis, doing arthroscopy <coughs> and taking out a piece of the meniscus, taking away some of the cartilage, is not going to improve their condition. It is not a way to treat osteoarthritis, quite simply. So again, don't do it. And that's simple to say, but uh, unfortunately it's not easy to convince your orthopedic colleagues that have been practicing this for a number of years. And of course the patients tell them that yes, thank you very much doctor, I got better and you got a good bottle of wine, etc. You continue happily onwards. The problem is that you have not in your clinic compared with another treatment such as exercise. That's been done in randomized clinical trials and published. Those were the ones you just saw. So that's what you need when you want to prove whether treatment is good or not. And the orthopedic surgeons that practice this tell me, but those with mechanical symptoms have better outcome after, after arthroscopic surgery. The die-hard arthros arthroscopists will actually tell me that. And they will be quite convincing. And I will shoot back on them and I say, no, they don't. <laughs> because there is actually good evidence that shows that no, those with mechanical symptoms actually don't get better than any other of within this group. There is a number of studies that show that they don't. Mechanical symptoms in this group of patients, the middle-aged and somewhat older, with a painful knee, without any appreciable trauma, even if they have mechanical symptoms, it is not a symptom of a meniscus lesion. It's a symptom of early stage osteoarthritis. That's it. And the mechanical symptoms are not relieved by arthroscopic surgery than in any other form of, of symptom that they have. So, don't do it, is my word. Now, being an orthopedic surgeon and going out there and showing, explaining these trial results is a bit of a challenge and you sometimes consider wearing a bulletproof vest or something like that. But uh, as I said in the beginning, I'm a believer in facts. I trust facts more than general beliefs. Uh, here is a graph showing over the years, starting 1997 up to 2016, the use of uh, 
arthroscopic surgery for a suspected meniscal tear in the knee in exactly the patient group I've been talking about. And if you look at the t top three curves, the uh, dark blue, light blue, or whatever it is, uh, purple, and the green one, those are the age groups going from 20 years up to actually, well, uh, what is it, 80 years. And those are the patients that are most frequently treated by this method, and those are the patients where it's been shown doesn't work. Those trials were published from 2002, almost one a year, up to 2010, and then a few more later. And it took more than 10 years for my colleagues to actually start taking notice and starting to become convinced or trust that this was actually a real results. We needed to publish some 10 studies in order to convince the professionals that right, this may not be working. Hmm. Maybe I should change my clinical practice. So what is going on here and why is this so difficult? Because we are now seeing history repeating itself. Uh, we've seen shoulder arthroscopy frequency going up quite dramatically over the last 10 years and now finally we've got a few studies showing that in spite of the evidence saying it's not being effective. This has been increasing and it's now plateauing and maybe it's going to start decreasing again, I hope. Hip arthroscopic surgery as well is increasing quite dramatically in the frequency in the clinical practice in spite of there being insufficient evidence to support the efficacy of this treatment. So this is where clinical development and clinical practice actually runs ahead of good evidence. And I would say again, I trust evidence, I trust facts, but beliefs from the individual clinicians saying this works, I'm a bit doubtful on because of the history of what, what I've just told you. So why is this? What is happening? Well. There are some psychological mechanisms which are clearly at play here and I won't go into detail other than saying that there is what we call in all of us, in you, in me, uh, in everyone, what we call confirmation bias. There is often also something called cognitive dissonance when something is kind of in our face that yes, we, this looks like it's probably true, but it's against my beliefs, then it's really uncomfortable for you. And then, of course, there are the vested interests. Uh, we all pay, need to pay our um, college fees for our kids and whatnot, and marketing forces and so forth. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately perhaps, orthopedic surgeons are human as well, and orthopedic surgeons are prone to confirmation bias. It's essentially not listening to something that's not true to their belief. And finding ways to actually avoid trusting the evidence by finding fault in it. You can look up those, these particular traits, it's quite interesting and I've seen them in operation in person and it's quite amusing actually to see how consistent it is. So when is there actually evidence enough to abandon ship for arthroscopic surgery of the knee there should have been a, there was evidence enough to abandon ship 10 years ago now it may be happening slowly but it may be happening and that's good to see because having fought hard in that area it's uh, some you sometimes uh, feel like giving up and uh, doing something else as i mentioned early on I believe that it's not really knowledge that we lack, but rather m what's missing is our courage to understand what we know and draw the conclusions of that when it comes to some forms of clinical evidence. And it's not, of course, isolated to orthopedic surgery. There are many medical areas that have classic histories of these things happening and where disinvestment in a clinical procedure should have been done long before and where many patients have died because of the wrong treatment being given to them in the belief that that was the right treatment but without the appropriate evidence for that. Now finally, total joint replacement. 
the surgery of the century, probably the last century and maybe also this century. But anyway, the right surgery for the right patient at the right time. That is actually the vision of the Opus program that Anne summarized early on here. And uh, let me explain to you why that program is actually needed, that research program. My presentation here that uh, you do in Australia roughly 100,000 knee and joint replacements per year. That's a rather high number. And comparing you with a number of other countries, you are a little bit above the average in the number of hip replacements you did in 2015. And that number, those numbers run from about approximately 300 to 8 on the OECD list of countries uh, in per 100,000 population. If you look at the knee replacements, you are a bit higher on that ranking in the upper one-third or whatever it might be. You're up there with uh, the US and Germany and the other uh, uh, countries and do quite a lot of knee replacements. And again, there is a sequence. And it's interesting for those uh, interested in marketing of joint replacements that China is down here, actually. So there's a market for the joint replacements uh, <laughs> manufacturers. And I also said, and here are the facts to prove what I said in the earl earlier on, that uh, the numbers keep increasing. And it makes you wonder, like you're thinking about oil production or whatever, when will peak production actually be? You're now doing knees and hips about 100,000 per year, and it keeps increasing. Where is it going to end? Where, where is the need? When is the need actually in balance with, with, uh, uh, with the production? And uh, uh, when will those numbers start plateauing? And that's a good question because in the US they're looking at uh, perhaps an even faster rise and there it's actually beginning to be a consideration how can we train enough orthopedic surgeons actually to provide, to supply for the demand? And this is really quite something that we need to start thinking about. And we need to think about whether we are actually doing joint replacements in the right patient at the right time. Because we know that approximately 20 out of 100 or 2 out of 10, if you will, joint replacements in those two patients, they are not satisfied. And it's generally not because there is something wrong with the implant or something wrong with the surgery. In most cases, we actually don't understand why these patients are not responding to the treatment, if I can use that term. Why these two patients out of the 10 are not happy. And two patients, well, that's not a big number, but that's actually every year in Australia, 20,000. 20,000. So we need to understand what the problem is. We need to get smarter in actually finding the right treatment for these patients that have the relatively advanced stages of osteoarthritis with relatively severe symptoms and figure out what treatment is right for which patient. And for those patients that perhaps, even though they have severe symptoms, are not the ones that will benefit from the joint replacement surgery, we need, of course, to be able to offer them something instead of the joint sur surgery that will help them. It's not a case of just saying, go away. We can't help you. It's, it's a case of actually finding what the problem is and being able, able, able to help these patients because obviously they have problems and they need help. So <coughs> what about new treatments for osteoarthritis? Are there any, is there anything on the horizon? Is there anything in the pipeline? Well, yes, many of the major uh, pharmaceutical companies are still trying to identify new targets, both for pain, uh, pain treatment in osteoarthritis, and there are new drugs in the pipeline, whether they will actually be successful in the clinical trials leading up to registration, etc. Of course, we don't know yet, but 
I hope they will because we do need something that is better than we have today. And are there any kind of new things that have not been, been looked at before? And yes, of course, there are, is any number of cellular mechanisms, but one of the mechanisms being explored or one of the pathways being explored is uh, the chronic innate inflammatory pathway. Innate meaning here it's something that actually we all have already from the beginning without uh, the case of, of raising new uh, antibodies or new mechanisms through infections or such. And these pathways go through various uh, 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 processes using cytokines, adipokines, various cellular receptors, chemokines, uh, inflammasomes, etc. and very complex pathways. And this is not the time to go into any details at all here. This is just my graphic to illustrate that yes, there is work trying to go, trying to identify new pathways that are relevant both for osteoarthritic pain, but also for the joint destruction that actually is part of the osteoarthritis development in the hope that we might be able to slow that down in the same way that we're now actually able to slow down the progression development of joint destruction in rheumatoid arthritis, the inflammatory joint disease. The challenges we are facing in osteoarthritis is, are many, but a couple of examples. Unless the osteoarthritis treatment is started early, biomechanics will change and uh, pain sensitization will happen, both distally, spinally and centrally, making <coughs> the pain more difficult to treat when pain, pain sensitization has already happened. And the biomechanics clearly will complicate any efforts to try to kind of correct the internal uh, structure of the joint. Because rebuilding cartilage matrix is very difficult and we may need to sort of start from the embryonic fetal stage in order to be able to do that. One question that the pharmaceutical companies are facing every time they come up to this point is, uh, should we kind of target a subgroup, a little niche group within the huge population of osteoarthritis, or should, be, should it be one size fits all? Personally, I think we should try be, to be smart and identify subsets in the population that might be amenable to treatment with any new agents that come into the market. And finally, Osteoarthritis is not osteoarthritis is not osteoarthritis. There are subsets within the population that progress with different, uh, different rate towards an end stage of the disease. There are patients that have more an, of, of an inflammatory component, swelling, warmth, etc. in their joints than others. There are differences in how patients develop the structural changes that we can see on imaging by MRI or uh, plain x-rays. So there are differences and we're trying to understand what these differences actually mean. And while these developments go on and they take a long time, from the time when a promising compound is identified to the time when it's actually in the very best of cases might be on the market is usually minimum five years, often ten years. So anything that looks promising today is not going to be out on the market until maybe five years from now. So in the meantime, while that goes on, we need to actually go back to basics and implement what we know is effective and disinvest invest, stop using treatments and procedures that we actually now know are not effective. I've not been talking about prevention today and that I certainly recognize because since we cannot really stop the disease by any treatment when it's kind of gotten started a very important aspect obviously is the prevention and there you have joint injury prevention programs which have been proven effective but only if they're used. Exercise programs are helpful 
for patients even in the earlier stages of osteoarthritis. Maybe that's not been shown, but it's an interesting thought that if you can get patients to go revert back to a healthy lifestyle, maybe the disease process in their joint could be slowed down or even, even reverted. But the majority of the patients with osteoarthritis will be able, with the means that I've described, to live well with their osteoarthritis using the GLAD program or the BOA program or something similar, or a digital app perhaps, through non-surgical interventions. A smaller proportion, maybe 20-30%, will advance to more uh, severe stage and may need surgical treatment and we do know today what is effective and we know certainly what's not effective such as arthroscopic surgery in these patients and there is even evidence saying that those that have arthroscopic surgery progress more rapidly to joint replacements than those who didn't so all the more reasons not to go through the arthroscope and uh, supporting again that thing called sustainable health care. Let me make one final plug here and that is uh, that uh, we need to practice. We need to practice the best practice based on the best evidence and essentially we need to build trials into studies that compare treatments into our everyday practice. We need to practice shared decision making between the patient and all health professionals involved in the management, in the treatment of that patient's osteoarthritis, meaning orthopedic surgeon, GP, physio, or wh whatever it is, uh, whoever it is that's involved. Shared decision making, we've not really been practicing that fully in the past, and that is an important aspect. We need to monitor and anal analyze health outcomes as a matter of everyday routine because if we don't measure, how can we improve? And we do need to eliminate in ineffective practices by overcoming bias and vested interests. So with that, I'll close and say thank you very much for your attention.